Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Morning. Good morning. So morning. I hope everyone is doing good this morning. I hope everyone is doing good this morning. A big welcome to our facilitators, if I can get a hi. Hi. And um, welcome to our participants as well. So um, I just want to find out how's everyone's morning going. I'm so glad it's sunny today in Joburg because it's been cold the whole week. So how's how's your morning going? Any of the facilitators or the participants can answer. My morning's okay. all right. <laughs> <laughs> My morning's okay. It's a bit warm. They said as well today, and it was raining for the week, so it's good. I'm happy. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So, before um, I'll be introducing our speaker, I just want to welcome everyone to today's session. We have the third session on um, our communication pillar, which is the leadership arena. So, um, let me just quickly get the in. Yes. So welcome to our speaker, Gondi Sasibeko. I hope I clicked that correctly. <laughs> so Gondi Sasibeko is a student and development practitioner with a background in youth and community development. She holds a Bachelor of Arts majoring in law and political studies and an honors degree in development studies from the University of the Witwatersrand. Her work in youth and community development be began in 2016 when she served as a deputy mayor of the Durban Youth Council and secretary of the Regional Executive Committee for the Youth Voices Conference in KwaZulu Natal 2017. During her tertiary studies, she served as secretary of the VITS Debating Union, um, vice chairperson of UNICEF VITS, a president of the Golden Key International Society, VITS chapter, and worked as a student intern at the VITS Development and Leadership Unit. She began her professional career running the She is Empowered program um, at the Africa Matters Initiative and worked as a corporate social investment coordinator at Hollywood Foundation. She is currently pursuing a, a, an MSc Africa and International Development at the University of Edinburgh. Her research interests lie in youth development, poverty alleviation, social movements, and transforming governance and gender relations in Africa. She seeks to contribute to the, uh, to the growth and spread of grassroots movements across Africa that allow um, for, her member, for members of the community to have a direct say in the matters that affect them. It is an honor to have you here with us, Gondisa, and let's welcome our speaker with a virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dino. I mean, the, the click is the last thing I'm worried about. I've been living in the UK <laughs> for eight months, so I, I, I very rarely hear it. <laughs> very few people get it, so I let it go <laughs> after I left. Um, okay, yeah. the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for inviting me for this session. I'm really happy and really honored to be here. Um, I really just enjoy uh, entering spaces where uh, we as women can have discussions. Um, I think that mentorship and just sharing any of the knowledge or experiences that we have is honestly so important in this day and age. So I get really excited when I see spaces like this uh, that exist. Um, so basically, Nondumisa just asked me to come and, and take you through a little bit of my leadership journey. Um, you've got a good basic overview of it um, on um, my bio, but I guess I'll walk you through the little things in between that and, and what happened in those, those that, that, what, that which is not necessarily communicated within the bio. And I guess just take you through what was going through my head when I did all of this and a lot of the lessons that I learned um, that have made me who I am today or the little steps that happened in between they took that took me to where I am today. Um, so my leadership journey essentially started in 2015. I was 16 years old and I left Joburg and my mom got a job in Durban. So my whole family moved down to Durban. Um, and it was a very 
jarring experience. First of all, just to move into a new high school in the middle of high school. I had only just uh, settled into the school I was in in grade nine. It took me two years going through all of grade eight and grade nine. So when we had to then move schools, but not just schools, provinces as well, I kind of had to reorientate myself in an entirely new city and once you're in grade 10 you know everyone's established their cliques and knows what's going on in the school um so it was just a very very uh, difficult experience when I first got there and when I when I got there to um Morris Taylor School the first thing I did was I just wanted to to embed myself in the environment, which is what I do when I get into a new space, right? So what is happening in the school? What is happening in the city? What are things that I can do? I'm just generally or naturally a very curious person. So I try to just figure out what activities they have going on and what interests me. Um, so when I got to the school, I did a series of things like debating, um, public speaking, netball. And one of the, there were two, activities that came up in my year. The first that I encountered being uh, the Youth Voices Conference. And it was put together by a couple of matric students in that year who had noticed overseas that there were so many spaces for young people to get together and to discuss important issues, whether it's uh, in, in the social realm or the economic realm or the political realm, and wanted that same for young South Africans and so they created the Youth Voices Conference, and I had attended, that was the first one that had been created in South Africa, and I attended that one as a participant, and the subsequent one, and then came back in matric to plan um, the 2017 one. Um, and the second thing that I had encountered in that year was the Durban Youth Council, and they essentially just choose four participants from about 100 schools in, across Durban to be a part of this nonprofit organization that's essentially run by grade 11 pupils, and we're broken up into six committees, and you just go around Durban and you do different um, almost their community service engagement projects, so there's sports and recreation, arts and culture, advocacy, and just different um, committees that are uh, geared towards specific causes. Um, and at the end of the year, I was elected as one of the deputy mayors for the council and then served my term um, in my grade 11 year. And that really embedded me within the Durban community because I met hundreds of different students from across the province at that point, as well as in the Youth Voices Conference. Then at the end of my grade 11 year from there, um, I was elected head girl at my school, um, netball vice captain, public speaking captain. Um, the head girl appointment was in parts, um, to some felt obvious, to some controversial. As I mentioned, I only got to the school in grade 10. Some schools have rules that like you can only be a head if you are there from grade eight. Um, so obviously some had felt that at that point I had served the school to the point where I should have been elected the head girl. Um, one of the things that came up in, in my grade 11 year was we had, when I first came, we had an, an SRC of some sort, which was basically run by the head girls and people would sort of attend the meeting. No one really wanted to be a part of it. So when we had our first meeting, they were like, ah, send the new girls, our representative, like she'll deal with it. Um, and it was just like meeting, discussing uh, the, that air con is broken in the classroom or this is broken. But it, when I had gone to the, the Durban Youth Council and I had met a lot of students from other schools, I saw how their SRCs ran. And I was so intrigued by, first of all, how seriously they took them, but how they were not just these meeting for people to complain about like menial things in the schools but there were spaces of creation they gave students or pupils almost this sense of 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 ownership over the school of how do we create this to make this the best experience for us and i was so intrigued by their structures and in some schools the head of the src gets to sit uh, in meetings with the in board meetings um so i'd taken it back to our school principal and i was like can we redo this, like, can we rebuild this whole system? And so a friend of mine and I relaunched the SRC in our school and we changed the entire structure. Um, and so by the time I had left them in my matric year, there were a couple of new practices that we'd managed to put in place to try to make the experience of high school a bit better for other people, but also to give them the option or the opportunity to take a level of ownership over their high school experience. Um, because sort of a, an attitude I picked up is, well, this is the way I found it. This is how it's always going to be. 
Um, but uh, I'd hoped by the time we'd gone, we'd instilled more of a culture of, well, you can change this. Um, and so just to take you through, I'm just gonna break it up into those three stages in my life being high school, undergrad, postgrad, and the lessons I'd learned in that time. Um, so looking at the lessons I'd learned just in my high school experience, the first is always be curious, which is what I tell people, you know, what you're good at or what you're going to enjoy in life it's not always just going to magically find you like you have some people that are lucky you like it from their youth from the age of three they're like I always knew I wanted to be a singer I always knew I wanted to be a doctor or my parents put me into this ballet program and then they just end up becoming like a professional dancer a professional athlete but for a lot of people that's not really the experience um you have to find it yourself and so the best thing to do is to honestly just be curious you don't have to immediately find your passion you just have to find something that interests you um, and to try to take part in it and from that point on you might open up an entirely different world for yourself so that's what happened with me for public speaking debating netball the durban youth council um and so yeah just try to look at things that might interest you um, the second is to not self eliminate. Um, I think there's a lot of things that I looked at and, and you'll see when I tell you a bit more about my university experience, sometimes opportunities and things come up and you feel like, no, I'm definitely not qualified for this. Like I'm not the right person to take on this job or this leadership role. Um, but you know that that saying that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So don't self eliminate, just try, just put yourself there. You never know. Um, sometimes I always say like one of the things that I guess my parents raised me with is just a whole lot of audacity to do things that I probably shouldn't be doing. Um, but you end up surprising yourself sometimes. Um, the third lesson I learned, which is probably the most important one for me, which is self-discipline, you're not going to have motivation a lot of the time. When you start something, you might, you might be motivated um, to do it. Um, but as time goes and as, have, as you have to keep being consistent, honestly, the only thing that's gonna save you is self-discipline. And that's honestly the main thing that got me through high school. Just showing up is already 50% of the work done. For me in high school, when it came to attending compulsory netball trainings, even the ones that started at half past six in the morning, it was never a matter of, do I want to go? It's just, I'm going. Okay, the coach says, to be a better team, we have to do this. We have to show up at half past six. Therefore, I'm going to show up. Um, and that really is half of the work. It's just self-discipline. It's something that I lost in my undergrad, which I'm trying to work back. But to identify what it is that you are required to do, and then to not give yourself a choice over it. If you have to wake up at this time to do this training, to do that, then it needs to happen. The next, which is kind of which is kind of related to that, is to be committed to the tasks that you undertake. One thing people like is somebody who is reliable. Um, and there's so many things in my life that I look back on where I feel like there was somebody better for this role or to be a part of this opportunity. But the people who were choosing saw me and they thought, no, but we can trust her. Like if we say we need somebody to show up at this time and do this we know that she's going to do it. For example, in my grade 11 year, I was selected to play for the um, KZN Action Netball team. And when I'd looked at the process, I'd felt like, okay, but I know that that person is definitely a better player than me. So what's happening here? Um, but I'd noticed that some people just didn't have the attitude for showing up for the practices regularly or the attitude to just follow the coach's instructions and to show up willing to do it. Um, and my coach saw me as somebody who is, we know she's going to show up. I know that if I tell her to do this training, she's going to do it. And she's going to be the player that we need her to be for the team. So people like somebody that is reliable. They will trust you with something if they feel that you can be trusted with it. Um, and the next is um, leadership is service, honestly. Um, if you enter a leadership for the title uh, that you're in, then you're in the wrong place and you're not going to benefit the people that you're working with and you're not going to learn from the experience either i always look at any leadership roles an opportunity to learn and to grow um, and the next which is sort of related to what i said earlier which is honestly a lot of the opportunities that you get in life are a matter of luck um, I believe hard work is super important, but I don't honestly don't believe anybody in life can take full credit for everything that they've achieved. 
sometimes an opportunity really just found you at the right place and at the right time. But the point is you need to be prepared when it finds you. Um, I found this really interesting quote um, by Kerry Washington, uh, where she said, you have to pray to catch the bus, but then you need to run as fast as you can after that, because you can pray and the bus can come, but if you're not running, you're not going to catch it. So it's that case of opportunity needs preparation. You find that like a lot of people, I think even if you look um, in, the, in the music industry where they have this one song that blows up overnight due to this particular thing, but then when you look back at their career, you see they've been doing this for like the last eight years. So something which can seem like an overnight blow up is something that has always honestly been years in the making. Um, the next is to try as much as possible to leave things better for the people that will come after you, even if you won't get to experience that. Um, so for example, uh, restarting or restructuring the SRC, it's not something I got to experience much, but the idea is that you find something and you see an experience that you didn't really like or that you feel like it shouldn't have been that way. Um, but to want to change that experience for other people, even if you're not gonna be there for it, I always get really intrigued by people that don't want to uh, improve something because they're not going to be able to experience that improvement. Um, then going on to my undergraduate uh, period, I then went to the Wits uh, University and I did a, a Bachelor of Art majoring in law um, and political sciences. And what I always find so interesting is just going into university, you find that a lot of people don't actually have enough information on what degrees are available and you find so many people change. And so for me, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to study. I just knew I wanted to help the country somehow or that I wanted to impact poverty somehow. And I was like, hmm, maybe I could be like a public protector or something. So I was like, let me just go do law and let me do a Bachelor of Arts and I'll kind of see how I find myself within that. And when I got into my second year of university, I realized I do not like law. Um, and the main thing was, it was a matter of um, what, what, what are the, the daily tasks in that, that you have to do. Um, I was reading this book, it was The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, and the most profound thing for me that came out of it was he said that when you're choosing your life's path, you shouldn't be looking at what it is that you enjoy doing. It's what kind of struggle do you enjoy, right? So if you look at, at like world-class athletes, um, the moment of glory that we see, like if you look at a sprinter, for example, the, that moment of glory is nine seconds, right? Like, bo like both entire careers and accumulation of all those nine seconds, but he isn't a world-class athlete because he really enjoys those nine seconds. It's because of all that training he does before, because everything that you have to do is going to have some sort of struggle. So I recognize that law isn't this, you know, winning all these court cases, the reality of law is re it's case law, it's reading and reading and reading and reading and analyzing and thinking. And I realized that I really just didn't like that. Um, but because throughout my undergrad, I was involved in a lot of um, different clubs and societies, I realized that I just really enjoy project management and project planning and community organizing. So I had to, to think and redirect myself as to, okay, what can I study next then that can help me along that path? And so at that point, I encountered an honors and development studies. So fortunately, I was doing a Bachelor of Art with law. So it was more of a liberal arts degree. So I got to just finish it and then move over to an honors after that and not pursue my RLB. So during my undergraduate period, um, I was uh, the secretary of the Wits Debating Union. Then I left debating after about a year and a bit. Um, then I was the vice chairperson of UNICEF Wits, um, where we were just organizing engagement projects. Um, and then I was president um, of Golden Key Wits which was really interesting. I had a great team um, and a challenging work environment and a lot of growth came out of that. Um, and then an interesting opportunity came out. So I don't know if you can hear that. That's my laptop overheating. It sounds like rain sometimes, but it's just my laptop being loud. Um, and then I was a part of the um, this development and leadership unit. Um, and the way I came across it was when I was serving in the Wits Debating Union, someone had called us for a meeting and a bunch of other societies to discuss something. And I was so intrigued um, by what the unit and the team was doing. And I approached them and I said, hey, I'm just like a random student here, but I would like to just do some work here. Like if there's any random things that I can get involved in or help plan, like I, I just think it looks interesting. 
Um, and sometimes you kind of have to follow up if they're busy because they'll be like, yeah, no, definitely. And then just like never respond to you. Um, but a couple of months later, we got in contact again. And it was that was my first, I guess, real professional experience. And I got to do so many interesting things there, like uh, helping them plan the Student Leadership Awards, um, like getting to write the invitation letter that went to the guest of honor, who was Dr. John Gani at the time. I uh, got to help um, create the online pre-orientation platform, um, which was just this, on, this online system that first years would encounter before they came to the university. And that was my first major project where they literally were like, here you go, make this happen. So I had to work with the American company that designed the system and create all the little tabs, populate the entire content of the website. What did I think first year students need to know about the university? Work with other people to create the university, to create the videos, essentially. Um, and so this was a, a really interesting um, experience for me. Um, and then going into my postgraduate period, at this point, I've been involved in a lot of committees and different things and just was sticking my foot in where I thought looked interesting to figure out what I liked. And once I hit my postgraduate period and then did my honors at WITS, I decided that I wanted to be more intentional about what I was directing my energy towards and about the initiatives that I was involved in. So at this point, I was like, okay, I'm done with university life. I need to find organizations that I can work for and sort of work in. Um, and at that point, I, I encountered the Africa Matters Initiative. I know, I think when I was a speaker here a couple of months ago, I think she was at some point. I've been following her on Instagram and Facebook for years at that point. So I'd been seeing the work that Africa Matters was doing and I thought it was interesting. Um, so I'd gone to apply there. And then I was the, uh, the program assistant for the She Is Empowered program, which is a little bit similar to this in format, um, but it's a, it's a year long program where we try to um, capacitate and empower about 20 young women across the African continent from 10 different countries to assist them with different skills. So we discuss like um, financial literacy, uh, feminism, uh, like various different topics. And then in the following year, in about 2021, 2022, I was then the program lead for that um, until I came to study at Edinburgh. And then during my honors year, it was very, um, in, in my second semester, I only had two courses, which amounted to two lectures a week. And so I just thought, okay, I actually have too much time on my hands. Um, so I need to find some kind of organization in, in South Africa that I can physically volunteer in so I can actually do a lot of physical volunteer work. So a lot of African matches was online at the time. And so I encountered the Hollywood Foundation Hollywood Bates was in the process of the foundation did not exist yet. They just had their CSI department um, and they were in the process of creating uh, a, an entirely separate body to be able to expand their uh, CSI work that they were doing. So I then came on as the first uh, CSI administrator um, to help in there, which is again, just shooting a shot with companies. Um, but I basically came in and I was just like, really, I'm just looking for like any kind of like, really, I was like, I'm just looking to volunteer, honestly, like to come in a couple of days a week and help you with whatever like project help you need, but ended up getting a job there. I don't know how I find myself in that, but I ended up with a full time job as a full time student with a, also like a part time job in Africa Matters. So it was a pretty interesting um, period. Um, but when I came into my, when I was doing my honors degree, that was the first time, and which would also showed me how, why, how I was so misaligned with my bachelor's, was that when I was doing uh, my law degree, I would just feel so drained in my lectures, or I was just trying to make sense of what was going on, when I could see that other people were really engaging with the content. And when I got into my honors degree, I was like, oh, this is what learning is supposed to feel like. I, it, like my brain just lit up. Um, and I suddenly, it wasn't just class, like schoolwork to me, it was life, it was reality. And suddenly I was able to start to develop things in my head in relation to the content and met a really awesome lecturer who introduced me to prefigurative politics and grassroots movements and, and anarchist concepts and just an entirely different world which led me into the research that I'm doing today and the degree that I'm doing today. If you've spoken to me at like undergrad, there's no world where a master's was. I wasn't even sure university was for me in the first place. So I was like, I'll get my honors and I'm gonna peace out. So it's funny now that I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a master's and then going to eventually go on to a PhD. Um, but essentially that's what happened. And then I finished um, my honors and I just thought, okay, I wanna get my master's. Um, I think I wanna, I've, I've studied, I've done two degrees in South Africa. I just want some experience overseas and let me go to the UK. They have some of the top um, courses in development there. I applied for the Rhodes Scholarship 
didn't actually think there was a chance I'd get it, but applied for that. I made it through to the final interview stage and was like, oh gosh, I could actually possibly get this. Um, didn't get it. And then was going to apply the next year. My mom said to me, you know what? That's like a whole ass year you're going to wait. Just apply to any university that you want to apply to. And let's just see what happens. Just apply. We'll see how you figure out the funding. Um, and so Rian, who's the current uh, CEO of Africa Matters, uh, pointed me in the direction of this Africa and International Development Program at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and was like, just apply. And she's like, I like this degree. She's actually coming to Edinburgh um, this end of this year to start the degree. Um, and I applied and I got, and the fees were, let me tell you the exchange rate to the UK and fees, one year of fees, especially as an international student amounts to like half a million a year. Um, and fortunately I got an email to let me know that, hey, there's the scholarship that's coming up. Um, it's for, we're going to offer it to one woman in Africa for this year. So for this course specifically and to do a PhD afterwards, so just apply um, and see what happens. And I thought that's a tall order, but any funding opportunity, I'll take it. Um, so I applied for it, went through the interview process, had to um, submit a research proposal um, and got the scholarship, which was just like the craziest thing. Um, and then that's how I ended up here, basically where I am now at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and essentially just to sum up the, oh, see we're out of time, but just to sum up some of the lessons I learned in this period um, of my life, which is it's that it's okay to not have things figured out. I know that like in, in teenagers are supposed to be like the really moody, crazy age group. But for me, I didn't have a moody teenage years. It was my early adult years going into university where I felt like my life just like didn't make sense to me. Um, because in high school, you know, there's everything is kind of set out. So you have your you're, you need to go from grade eight to grade nine to grade 10 to matric. Basically, you, you know what you need to be doing. But once you get to university, it's it's kind of here. It's it's up to you, really, what's going to happen to your life. And just going into adulthood, trying to figure out what you want to do, realizing you're in the wrong degree. You see, that's where I learned that like the ABCs doesn't really exist. I saw a lot of people in that time just doing really what works for them. Some repeated a year. Um, some just changed degrees and started all the way from the beginning after doing like three or four years of a degree. But basically, I really learned here that it's honestly okay to not have things figured out. You don't need to know what the next 10 years of your life needs to look like. You just need to know what the next best step is. So going into my honors year, I literally did not know what I was going to be doing in the next year. Um, and so I was just focused on, okay, what is the next thing that I'm going to do? I remember telling my dad, when I got the scholarship and he said to me, you know, I really feel like you're putting one foot in front of the other. So this is good. You're just, you're just making movement. And that's really all you need to be doing at this point is just put one foot in front of the other. Don't be worrying about what the next five or 10 years is going to look like if you don't know um, what it is. Just what do I need to do next? And that it's really okay to start again. I, I know a lot of us feel like we need to stick to one thing and then just really excel at that. But it's really, also you're all really young, it's really okay to, to just reinvent yourself if you feel like you need to do that. Um, and that your, your journey is not somebody else's and your values and your definitions of success are not theirs either. As I started to engage more with poverty in South Africa and anarchist politics, it sort of just came to me that my, my idea of success really drastically changed. At one point it was being the speaker or this like internationally renowned person. And now my goals are a lot more community based, if that makes sense. So those huge things are not that they no longer appeal to me, but they are no longer what I direct, what I strive for. They're no longer the goal. If they happen, it's a byproduct of what else I'm doing, um, but they're not what I'm like gearing my energy towards. Um, and the next lesson is just, Building something great or meaningful is the accumulation of many consistent activities over time. Um, you know, sometimes when I look back at my CV, I'm like, oh, damn, this is this is looking good. Or someone will be like, no, man, I saw your LinkedIn. This is great. And I'm like, yeah, it's I don't even know how that all happened. It wasn't it wasn't the it wasn't the goal. Um, I was just doing things sort of as I was going along. But the creation of something worthwhile or meaningful at the end really takes a lot of consistent activity over a long period of time. Um, and the next is just that the way you, you treat people matters. Um, and this is more so stuff I've learned as I've gone into like the corporate world and all of my different workings. I've, I've seen some people, especially as sort of you rise 
and position sort of start to neglect that factor that you shouldn't really be treating people based on what they feel, that when what you feel they can give you, or if you feel that they deserve respect, just treat people well in general. And you just want to leave a good taste in people's mouths after they've interacted with you. But also you do not know who's sitting in the room with you. Um, and then lastly, it's just that morals and public image matters. I've just been seeing just a, a really uh, interesting trend of really promising young people in South Africa, kind of engaging in weird corporate shady behavior and like the world is small. Um, so to just really take your, your public image seriously, um, we were discussing, when I was in the Alan Bray Obers Foundation, we were just discussing personal branding. And we were like, personal branding, grow up, not a celebrity, like, who am I branding towards? And it's like, no, you as a person have a, have a personal brand, you have a public image, even if it's just the people around you. And that's something you want to take care of, you know, reputation is just one of the, it's free, it's really like one of the, the, the things that you, that you have, that you have total control over. So just be mindful of how you conduct yourself just around other people, how you conduct yourself um, publicly and to just be as, to maintain integrity, you know, with everything that, that you do. I think it's, there's nothing more heartbreaking than watching somebody really do something great for themselves. And then they were, so there were decisions or the ways in which they conducted themselves, which really destroyed that, you know, a reputation is a very difficult thing to build and so easy to destroy in a second and very difficult to, to recoup after it's been destroyed. So to just respect that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's my story. That was I'm so long-winded, sorry. But that was everything, basically. Just my experience leading up to where I am now and what I've learned. And I hope something was helpful in there for someone. Thank you so much, Pondisa. Um, I think what I picked up from you is that in leadership, evolution is so necessary for growth, even though it can be so challenging. And um. I also want to just share that from the stories that you shared is that we can sometimes just underestimate the power of things just falling into place, you know, even if we don't know how it's going to happen, but it will happen, you know. Um, the lessons that you have shared tie in so perfectly with the leadership arena that we are hosting today. And I hope that our participants um, noted the germs of wisdom that you have shared with us. I'd like to open the floor to any um, questions or comments from anyone um, to Kondisa. You're also welcome to type in the chat box if you're struggling to use your mic. I'll give you a couple of seconds. You can raise your hands as well, and then we'll take questions. Okay, I see one. Is that that there? Yes. Hi. Um, I don't have a question. I just um had a comment. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story with us. I think it was just really, really inspirational for myself. Um, and I know everyone else was inspired. And I wanted to say, just in terms of leadership. Um, for me, as much as I wanted to be in leadership for a really long time, it kind of intimidated me. Because I was like, oh my word, everyone seems to know what they're doing and everyone mm -hmm. seems to have this like massive plan. And then, like they have all stuff like figured out. And so I think just also learning from you that like sometimes you may not know what you're going to be doing in 10 years. And so it's just important to have the next step, like just take the next step. And baby steps are super important because when you see the mountain ahead of you, you're like, my work how am I going to do this mm. um so yeah I just wanted to say thank you so much it really really did inspired um it inspired me I know it inspired so many of us as well um and I just wanted to also say it made it um that much more um I don't know if we can say obvious if obvious is the right word but the fact that leadership is very much like attainable it's accessible to us especially as women and it's amazing seeing women as well being in spaces of leadership so thank you oh thank you so much for your comments yeah no definitely I just the idea of having things figured out I also as I was saying as I've gotten older my idea of what leadership looks like has changed as well I mean what I want for myself doesn't necessarily have to be what people, how people pictured in the traditional sense of like being the head of a committee or having a specific title. Sometimes just the, the work that you're doing uh, just establishes you as a leader. Um, I, I encountered like a really interesting woman in the work that I did 
um, when I was uh, working at the Hollywood Foundation. It was this woman who was living in Bombay, this informal settlement. And she just kind of recognized Bombay has a very, it's in Inanda, it's got a very bad reputation in terms of just like crime and safety and, and development. And she just recognized the issues that were there. And she said, okay, cool. I am going to start a sewing club and I'm going to teach women in my community how to sew so that they can make a living for themselves. She would notice an issue where there were young girls who were just being assaulted by male family members at home. And when they went to the parents to go be like, hey, let's go to the police, they were like, oh, sorry, no, he's a breadwinner. We're not going to do that. So she just created an after school program to keep all these children um, in a room to learn about leadership and to learn about different things, uh, to play chess, just to keep them um, occupied until their parents, until their mother came home. And I just looked at this woman like, my goodness, like what a leader. Um, but she's just someone most people don't even, she's just doing her thing. Um, and she just described herself as a crazy lady with a vision. Um, and sometimes just something has to spark you or interest you and you sort of run with that. Um, so, and, and just also to really rely on community. Um, one of the things I guess I, that also removed me from the, like the traditional idea of leadership is that you yourself have to have the vision and have to know what's going on and have to know how to execute it. But like, you don't always know half, you don't have to know how everything happens. That's why you involve other people because other people may have an additional vision or skills that may help you reach that. So just the importance of, of establishing people and a network that you can work with to achieve that vision or change the world in the way that you want to. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Thank you so much, Nkadego. I also actually would like to ask a point that um, I found interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what type of mindset helps you to continue doing what you don't necessarily enjoy, but it leads you to like something that you could potentially enjoy in the future? Because you mentioned how when you were studying in your undergrad, you weren't necessarily um, enjoying what you were doing. But once you progressed into postgrad, you started yeah. understanding what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it was the, the point of discipline. Um, so there's some things and commitment, right? I started this degree. It had I, I think maybe had I recognized that there was no way out, like maybe had I been doing like engineering or something, and then I was like, ah, I don't like this. I couldn't, I don't think I'd know how to pivot out of engineering. Um, so some people just like leave and start something else. But I have a really, I have a really hard time quitting. Um, I don't know if it's just like a, 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 a like a fear of not being committed or a fear of disappointing people. But usually when I when I take something on, I see it through um, and I, I just, I need to finish it. So when I realized this, I was probably in the middle of, of my second year of university, which means I, I'd done like a year and a half and I had a year and a half left basically. Uh, and I was just like, I just need to finish it. Um, and so when you really don't wanna do something, really the only thing that's gonna take you through is just discipline and the fact that you've committed to doing this thing, um, but then you can, set up a plan for what that's going to look like afterwards. So I recognized that the, the, the degree wasn't a dead end because it was a Bachelor of Arts. I still got to explore the social sciences within that, um, which is why I stayed in it. Um, but to really just be committed, I think maybe if something is really harming you, then maybe you should let it go. Um, but otherwise, uh, I, uh, I, I just stayed to something. Like when I was leaving for Edinburgh, my mom said to me, because the, the scholarship was also for a PhD afterwards, which I didn't plan to do, which means I'd be here for four years. And my mom said to me, she was like, hey, listen, if it doesn't work out, you can always just come back home. She's like, I know it seems like a whole big deal and like, but don't feel the need to like suffer through that. Like, if you're really not feeling this, then you can just come back home. And my grandmother was like to her, you don't want to encourage the child to quit. Like, don't say that to her. Like, what if she just like leaves? And mom goes, no, I know my child. It's going to take like heaven and earth to get her to quit something that she started. So she don't, she, she's not going to come back, but like she'll come back if she's really struggling. So just dis self-discipline. Um, sometimes as long as it's not like a toxic environment or something that's really harming you, just see things through. Um, it's, it's just not about whether you want to do it or not. You started it, just finish it. Thank you so much for that. Um, do any of the participants, um, would you like to ask a question? Before I ask uh, closing remarks from our speaker. No, Lufo, you can, you can ask the question. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. 
Um, it was a pleasure meeting you, and yeah, it seems like you've achieved a lot, and it seems like you're still going to do great things. And thank you so much for just your contribution to society and amongst women as well. Um, my question is, it's mostly on consistency. See, um, I struggle a lot with consistency. Um, and I may be passionate about something, fully in, fully invested and everything, but it's just when I have to continually have to, you know, I don't know, something happened. I don't know what it is. I don't know what, but I may have the drive for it. I may be enthusiastic for the thing and whatnot, but it's just being consistent. So um, I would like to hear from you, how, how did you deal with those type of things if you ever struggled with consistency and how did how did it get, get you through and what were the steps that you had to take maybe things that you had to eliminate from your life mm -hmm. change of mindset just mm -hmm. all of those things ah thank you so much um for the question and lovely to meet you as you were saying that i just couldn't help but think of about two months ago, a friend of mine here, we decided we're going to go to the gym consistently, like nothing hectic. We're like, we're not doing like hectic, like fitness or CrossFit. We're just going to just like walk on the treadmill and lift some weights. And we was we were so good about it for the first three weeks. We're going like three days a week, um, like hit week number four. Like we still wins. But I remember I texted her and I was like, we have to do this again. Like, don't I just get a medal for going to the gym for three weeks? Like, I just, just like a dream body, it's done. Like, I have to come back and do this. Like, like that makes no sense that I have to keep doing this. Um, so, no, I, I get that point of consistency. I think in high school, I was just, I don't know what was going on in my head. I was just so disciplined. I still don't know what was going on there. And once I, I hit adulthood and university, it's just, it's discipline is a struggle um, and just getting yourself just to do things really is a struggle. But honestly, I think dropping my discipline and, and, and the consequences of that was a really good lesson for me because um, being consistent in something, you, you see the value of it when you're not consistent and you see the consequences of what that looks like, right? So it's, it, it doesn't have to be like something massive, like, some, like something huge happened, but it's just a matter of some just, just wasn't doing as well as I was doing before. Or even now, like I, there's an assignment I was, I slept at 4 a.m. this morning because I was doing an assignment that I should have done a long time ago, but I was just not feeling doing it. So I ended up staying up all night to try to finish it. Um, so for me, what really drives me, I think in moments where, to, to be more disciplined, where I'm really not feeling it, is to know what the consequences of that look like. Like going to the gym, I, 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 the reason I go to the gym as much as I can is just for stress relief. I just have a very, stress is in my genes. Um, and, and my dad always tells me, he's like, yo, just like jog, just take a walk. Like that's like, you, you, you stress is going to build up over time and it's really going to hit your health. Um, and so I go to the gym just, just to manage that stress. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have like a super awesome answer, but it's just, I, I think of the consequences. It's like, if I don't do this in a couple of years, like maybe my health is going to hit like a, like a downturn or I'll have a premature heart attack. Like my dad describes me, he says, I'm not a stressed person. I am stressed. Like I am stressed in human form. Like if there's nothing to stress about, I will find something to stress about. So you just have to find ways to mitigate that. Um, and so that's why I try to be disciplined. I hate pulling all nighters, which is why then I have to try sometimes and fail all the time to force myself to be disciplined. Um, and I think that's like the only thing that can really drive you is to, to be able to recognize what it's going to look like if you don't do it. You know, there's some projects that I wanted to start like years ago and just didn't. And then you look at like the people that did it, right? Um, and you're like, damn, I could have been there. Like I could have done this had I just stuck to it. Um, so yeah, I, there's no like magical answer. Sometimes, like I said, you just have to not give yourself a choice. Like it's it's not a matter of if I want to wake up. Like that's when I don't go to the gym. When I wake up and I'm like, do I want to go? Like when I was in high school, my alarm went off and I was out of the bed before it finished going off. I didn't sit and give myself a chance to think about it. So to just decide what you need to do and to not leave an option. And then obviously structure your life in a way um, that accommodates for you to be able to do the things that you need to do and just prioritizing that so that you you limit the distractions as much as possible. But yeah, no, I mean, good luck with it. It's hard. I, I, I still don't have it figured out, man. I'm, I'm still like <laughs> doing my assignments last minute, <laughs> but I get the struggle. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Thank um, you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Noruvo. Um, we have a question in the chat. I'll just read it out quickly. Hey, Kondisa, how do you manage your time so that you don't have to fall behind with the work you have to do? I mean, full disclosure, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't manage my time. It's, it's still one thing I haven't figured out yet. I, I have like the worst time management that I know of any human being. Uh, so I do fall behind with my work and then do things last minute. Um, but I can tell you what I've learned from that. And hopefully that can help you. Um, which is you, you need to set up a kind of environment to help you to, to be to be most conducive to your production. So I don't study in my room. Um, it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. Like I do not say, I do that at home because it's the only choice I have. But here in, 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 in Rez, there's like, there's there's a common room, there's a bunch of desks, there's a library. Uh, even though there's a desk in my room where I am now, it's like if there is a bed in the room where I'm sitting, I'm going to get into that bed at some point. Or if I have like my earphones and when they get distracted, if I play a certain kind of music, I'm going to sing along. So I think one of the things is to set up a plan for yourself. And I tried, man. Like I was in the library every day for like the first month of this year, but did I do any work? So you have to try to put yourself in the environment to be able to do that work and set up the plan and, and try to stick to that. Because when you finish things early, like the, the relief is just so much better. Like I look at some people who like finished their assignments like a week in advance and they got a tutor to be able to redo it. Um, and for me, it's just like a, a young push, like at the very end. Um, so to try to manage your time, set those timelines, but then you need to try to set up an environment to help you achieve that. Um, don't just like trust that you're going to sit up and go so that you just can get it done. If you know that you're going to go back to your brain pretty soon, or if you can't even be in the building, like where you live, or you go to a, try to go to a library, or I find that a public space keeps me accountable. Um, when I see everyone around me, like looking really serious and studying, eventually I get down to studying as well. But the best thing is just to like, don't, don't try to uh, rely on like your own willpower because sometimes you just don't have it. Just try to put yourself in a space that's going to force you to study. And study buddies, so so helpful. That's actually the best thing. My friends as well have no time management. Um, so it's really, really helpful when you find someone as well to work with. I've seen people get on a WhatsApp call, video call, and they just put their phone up like that in the corner and they have their friend uh, in the screen working as well and they're working. Uh, so that can be helpful as well. I and mean, then you take a study break at the same time. I think that's been the best thing to make sure that I actually do something is just to have an accountability partner and to put yourself in a space where you're kind of forced to study. But yeah, man, after falling behind multiple times, I mean, I guess it's the only thing that's really gonna push you <laughs> to want to manage your time well. Still figuring it out though. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll just give a last opportunity for anybody to ask something before we close. So if you have a question, don't be shy. Feel free to ask. Okay, um, Ondisa, I think just to close uh, the conversation, I'd just like you to share a few tips with our participants today on um in terms of taking up space in leadership and um being able to just place yourself into into two spaces without especially for like more, the more introverted personalities as well just how to have like the bravery put yourself into spaces mm -hmm. okay um i think um some of what i said uh before i applied as well but i think the biggest thing is just to not self-eliminate I think that's that's the, the the greatest barrier to anybody's success. I guess other than like more like structural ones, but I think a lot of us take ourselves out of the game before we even like give ourselves a chance to see if we know how to play it or not. Um, I've met a lot of introverted leaders and a lot of people that are doing great things. So to just give yourself the chance, even if you think that you're not you might not be good at it or if you think that there's a bit that people like there's, there's so many there's this there's so many people where you're like hmm, who just took the chance the opportunity to do it so that's honestly my biggest thing which is just don't um don't self-eliminate um and take the opportunity to learn from other people as well um to I, that's why i like spaces like these as well is you don't have to do things alone you don't have to know how to do things alone I mean, the, when I restarted the SRC, I didn't go alone. It was an introverted friend of mine who I was like, girl, please just be back up. 
just come with me into the office. You don't have to say anything. Like, just come with me and just sit there, like when I'm telling the principal, like what's happening. Uh, so there really is strength in communities. I think there is the most strength in communities. Um, I don't think we can really achieve anything meaningful alone. I think that, 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 that African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. Um, so don't self-eliminate and community, a lot of power in community. Uh, I, I bet you if you could throw a stone and hit like five people that have the same idea as you. So why not work together with them to do what you're trying to do? So give yourself a chance and don't be afraid to approach people. I, I regret very little of the things that I've done, but I think I regret the most of things that I didn't try. Um, failure is not like a, it can feel really terrible in the moment, but really it's, it's a necessity. So you need to give yourself a chance to put your foot in the mud um, and to make mistakes and ideas that you're doing. Try to get as much advice as you can um, about something you wanna do before you do it. Um, and from speaking to people who've done it before, um, but otherwise just do it, like just, <laughs> plugging Nike, just, just do it, just go ahead and, and do it. Um, but community, I think that's the biggest thing. I've, I've never done anything alone and like succeeded at it. And it's always been, it's always been a, a, a culmination of the work and an and, and energy that other people have invested in me as well. Um, but basically mm. community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you for the work that you do. I'm very inspired and I hope everybody else is feeling just as inspired, if not more. Um, I just like all of us to say bye to our speaker. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to have been here. It was really lovely to meet all of you. Um, enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Bye. bye. So we're just going to wait a bit for us to go into the breakout rooms so that our facilitators can give us the presentations.